Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Judicial Independence and Peril Panel. Uh, I had a uh, list of instructions about what I'm supposed to tell you, and I left my file in the other room, and it's, <laughs> it's gone. So also, I had lots of information you would have enjoyed, uh, and that's also gone. <laughs> the one thing I remember is that you're supposed to turn off your cell phones. Um, including the members of the panel. Let's see if I turned off my cell phone. Um, so I'll skip uh, all the introductory remarks, including all the essential evidence about how many states have elections, how many are partisan, how many are nonpartisan, how many have appointments, how long a term the justices have, and uh, maybe they'll mention all of that during their presentations. So, what else I was supposed to tell you, an introduction I'm sure you don't really want to hear anyway. Uh, the one thing, one thing I remember I was supposed to tell you is who the sponsor is, if we had a sponsor, but this I think is one of the few panels nobody wanted to sponsor. <laughs> uh, so, we'll just go to the problem of judicial independence and peril in the state courts. And, I'll start with Justice Turnus, former Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, who may have a lot to tell us about recent developments. Justice Turnus. Good morning. I've been asked to, um, actually, I, I guess I've interpreted, give a little speech about what happened in Iowa to set or to provide a context or a base, I guess, for the discussion that we're going to have as uh, a panel. And I want to start by thanking you for asking me to participate in this discussion of judicial independence and the impact of the politicization of judicial elections on that core value of our society. And I call it a core value because our founding fathers believed that the complete independence of the courts of justice was essential in our form of government to guard the rights of the minority from the will of the majority and to guard against the oppression of the legislative and executive branches of government. These underpinnings of judicial independence were recently tested in Iowa, where money was spent in the 2010 judicial retention election to oust three members of the Iowa Supreme Court, and I was one of those uh, justices, to oust uh, three of us who had participated in a decision legalizing same-sex marriage. The campaign against the justices was intended to send a message of retaliation and intimidation to judges, not only on the Iowa Supreme Court, but more importantly to judges across the country, a message inconsistent with the concept of a judiciary charged with the responsibility to uphold the constitutional rights of all citizens. Now before I discuss the 2010 Iowa retention election in more detail, it might be helpful for me to set the stage by explaining the judicial selection system in Iowa. I don't presume that, that you are familiar with our little state and how we uh, choose judges. Since the early 1960s, Iowa has had a commission-based merit selection process known uh, as the Missouri Plan. A 15-member nonpartisan commission screens and interviews applicants for judicial office and submits the names of three candidates to the governor who is then required to appoint the new judge from the commission's nominees. The other aspect of Iowa's merit selection process is retention elections. In a retention election, a judge runs unopposed and voters simply choose whether to retain a judge for another term. Historically, politics had played no role in judicial retention elections, and Iowa appellate judges had not found it necessary to form campaign committees, to engage in fundraising, or to campaign in any manner. I'd been on the retention ballot uh, two or three times before, and I, I think I can say uh, with accuracy, I, I know there was never any money spent in any of those, but I know of no, not even one dollar spent in any retention uh, campaign or retention election on the Iowa Supreme Court since the 1960s. The 2010 retention elections were very different from previous uh, elections due to the Iowa Supreme Court's decision in Varnum versus Breen, 
In the 2009 Varnum decision, the Iowa Supreme Court unanimously held that Iowa's Defense of Marriage Act violated the Iowa Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. After stating in our decision in that case that Iowa's Constitution required the state to allow same-sex couples to enter into the civil contract of marriage, and that's how the Iowa statute defined it as a civil contract, the court expressly pointed out that, quote, religious doctrine and views contrary to this holding are unaffected, and quote, a religious denomination can still define marriage as a union between a man and a woman. Notwithstanding the fact that the court's ruling did not affect religious beliefs or practices, substantial opposition to the retention of the three justices on the ballot the following year came from individuals and groups who believed the court had violated God's law or natural law. In fact, uh, during this whole campaign against us, I don't recall once hearing any of our opponents uh, or detractors criticize our equal protection analysis. Uh, rather, the focus was just on this general argument that we had violated God's law. There was also uh, arguments, and I'll talk about those later, that we didn't even have the power of judicial review, but no criticism of our equal protection analysis. Through an effort called Project Jeremiah, preachers were urged to use their pulpits to advocate for a no vote on retention of the justices notwithstanding that such action might jeopardize their tax-exempt status. Churches were so involved in the election that some of them applied for and were allowed to become satellite voting sites. As a result, voting booths were set up in church vestibules of these approved sites so members of the congregation could vote while they attended services. Notwithstanding this grassroots mobilization of opponents of same-sex marriage, the fundraising and media campaign against the justices was anything but grassroots. The primary leader of the campaign against retention was a Mississippi group affiliated with the American Family Association. They were joined by Washington, D.C.-based Family Research Council, Arizona-based Alliance Defense Fund, Georgia-based Faith and Freedom Coalition, and New Jersey-based National Organization for Marriage. According to um, AFA, the American Family Association, its stated purpose in ousting the three justices was to send a message, quote, in Iowa and across the country that the ruling class ignores the people at its peril. This mission reflected the demonizing and misleading nature of the, its campaign. For example, AFA out of Mississippi called its program against the Iowa justices Iowa for Freedom. And I agree with the person who wrote a letter to the editor commenting on the misleading nature of the name of this program. As this writer said, Iowa for Freedom is not from Iowa, and it is not for freedom. Nonetheless, its campaign rhetoric struck a chord with Iowans who were upset with the court's Varnon decision. And I want to spend a bit of time talking about what that campaign message was. This group's local spokesperson argued, appointed judges are dictating from the bench which societal beliefs are acceptable and which ones are not. But, he claimed, the retention election was not about gay marriage. It was about liberty. Asserting the court, quote, legislated from the bench, he said, if they will do this for marriage, all your liberties are up for grabs. Let me give you an idea of how that message was reinforced in their media campaign. In a television ad sponsored by Iowa for Freedom, the National Organization for Marriage and the Campaign for Working Families, the narrator told viewers, if they can redefine marriage, none of the freedoms we hold dear are safe from judicial activism. These words were spoken as images of parents, Boy Scouts, hunters, and flag-saluting children were shown on the screen. In reality, the Iowa Supreme Court took away no one's liberties or freedoms in the Varnum decision. To the contrary, the civil rights of same-sex couples to the secular benefits that flow from the civil contract of marriage were upheld, while the religious freedom of individuals and religious institutions to define the religious institution of marriage as only between one man and one woman was preserved. 
So what was the response to these inaccurate and demonizing attacks on the judiciary? I think I can accurately sum it up by saying too little too late. As for the three of us who were on the ballot, we decided early on not to form campaign committees and not to engage in any fundraising. We did not want to contribute to the politicization of the judiciary in Iowa by campaigning like politicians, even if it meant losing our jobs. Our hope is that the Bar Association and others would come to our aid. They did, but not with the vigor, organization, or political savvy that was required to counteract the emotionally laden and factually inaccurate television ads that ran incessantly for the three months prior to the election. Our supporters permitted our opponents, who were extremely well organized and well funded, to define the issue as one as being one of voting, voting for liberty and freedom over activist judges. In the end, out-of-state special interest groups opposing same-sex marriage spent over $1 million in the Iowa retention elections, significantly outspending groups supporting the justices on the retention ballot. One leader of the campaign against retention declared after the election, Iowa voters had done, quote, God's will by standing up to the three judges who would try to redefine God's institution. And of course, that's not at all what we did. I have just a few observations based on what I witnessed in Iowa that I'll share before I give the microphone uh, over to the panel. Money to unseat judges who make politically unpopular decisions is plentiful. In fact, the groups who were successful in Iowa have vowed they will not stop with the removal of three justices from the Iowa Supreme Court. They bring a substantial national organization and a, and a highly developed strategy into campaigns against judges that will require judges on the ballot who are targeted by these groups to raise significant funds to counteract these attacks. So what does this mean for the future? Certainly that e the elections targeted by these special interest groups will become politicized. And the Iowa experience shows that a merit selection system such as the Missouri plan does not prevent that from happening. Retention elections can be hijacked by groups intent on undermining, undermining the independence of the judiciary as easily as any other type of judicial election. The bigger concern, I think, is that is what these incidents of influence and intimidation mean for our system of justice. My fear is that efforts to intimidate and influence the judiciary will, over time, destroy the ability and willingness of judges to do their duty as faithful guardians of the Constitution and will result in the election or selection only of judges willing to be, as someone once said, warriors in service to a particular ideology. And let me just briefly explain what I mean. One of the most fundamental and timeless values of our free society is the rule of law. America's justice system is based on the rule of law, a process of governing by laws that are applied fairly and uniformly to all persons. Because the same laws are applied in the same manner to everyone, the rule of law protects the civil, political, economic, and social rights of all citizens, not just the rights of the most vociferous, the most organized, the most powerful, or the most popular. Applying the rule of law is the sum and substance of the work of the courts. When judges make decisions based on who they will please or displease, or whether they will be reelected or retained, we cease to be a nation governed by the rule of law. The politicization of judicial elections encourages decision making based on a judge's self-interest, which is, does not bode well for our future. If judges act like politicians to get on the bench or to retain their seat or decide cases like politicians or theologians in robes, courts will eventually and justifiably lose their credibility with the people. And when that happens, this society and our democracy are in serious trouble. In my view, it is our collective responsibility to support and advocate for a judiciary with integrity, one free from politics and political elections, free from intimidation by special interest groups, and free from the influence of campaign contributors. Only if we, as a society, 
have an unwavering commitment to an independent judiciary, can we assure future generations that they too will enjoy a society governed by the rule of law and not by the agendas of those individuals and groups willing to use their money to influence and intimidate the judiciary? Thank you very much. Uh First comment I would like to make on that is I'm glad I'm a federal judge. Uh, I'm a member of a panel that has to decide the constitutionality of gay marriage. And it's nice not to have to worry about the problems there were in Iowa. But I also want to tell you I'm a Californian and the experience of Iowa is not dissimilar from the experience we had in California a number of years ago when three Supreme Court justices were removed in a retention election, and there the issue was capital punishment. Uh, the other thing I, I hope the panel will discuss is the increasing uh, number of elections decided by uh, co campaign contributions, although usually it's two-sided in those elections. Uh, there are the elections of one economic interest against the other. Uh, the, uh, and I hope that we can talk as we hear from different state court justices about what suggestions they have for improving uh, the problem that uh, Justice Turner has described for us. You know, about half the states, I think, since I don't have my notes, if it's not true, I'll make it up. Uh, about half the states, I think, have elections, and the other half have appointments. But after a short time in most states, uh, there is a confirmation process, an election process, in which those recent appointees can be removed. Uh, thereafter, there's a six to eight year period for a term for a number of uh, the states, and a 10 to 12 year period for a large number of others. There are only three states in which, you, which there are lifetime appointments or appointments until the age of 70. Uh, do you all think it would be better to have more lifetime appointments? Do you all think it would be better to have more elections? Should they be partisan or nonpartisan? Does it make a difference? Uh, what do you think of the process in general and how it can be improved? Our next uh, speaker is, I don't know, I'll just pick one at random. Our <laughs> next speaker is former justice, or present justice, uh, Mark Martin of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Thank you, Judge Reinhardt. Uh, let me start with this fundamental question. If we all agree that the values that really matter here are fairness, impartiality, independence, then we should try to design our system to give primacy to those values. Anytime you inject an election in that situation where you're wanting judges to be fair, impartial, and independent, all of a sudden you have a degree of conflict that inherently arises. And let me be very specific. Justice Turnus talked about a merit selection plan but nevertheless, in many states that have a merit selection plan, there is also a retention election where there will, in fact, be voting on the justice's retention or non-retention. So I think at the outset, consistent with what just Judge Reinhardt just said, that probably the best approach for judicial independence is an appointment process and life tenure. Now, what is the problem with that model? Well, a lot of the polling data suggests that not everybody agrees with that. So at a normative level, if we want to enhance judicial independence, uh, appointive systems, life tenure, would seem to uh, help preserve all of those three values that I articulated a moment ago. And it is interesting that many of the states over time uh, historically went from a point of systems to some type of elective system. So where does that leave us? 
Well, there are several things that we can discuss to try to improve the situation we have. Within the American Bar Association, after decades of trying to bring about uh, appointive systems to the states and having very uh, minimal success, we began to look at ways to try to incrementally uh, help the process and to better preserve fairness, impartiality, and judicial independence. Consider this. If we're trying to promote fairness, impartiality, and independence, how does that work when we also have an increasingly uh, exaggerated public discourse and debate? where you have a judge that has served on the bench for two decades, but it's her one decision that is controversial that her entire judicial tenure is evaluated by. Uh, secondly, think about the demands of the election process itself and the distinctive role of judges. Judges should not be behaving like legislative and executive branch officers. They appropriately place a platform before the voters and ask the voters to join with them in carrying out that platform. That should not be the case with judges if what we expect of judges is to take an oath to uphold the Constitution, the laws, and to promote the values of fairness, impartiality, and independence, uh, all of that necessary for the rule of law. So in states that are unwilling to move away from elective systems, what the citizens of those states necessarily need to understand is that their judges, at least generally, will not enjoy the degree of judicial independence that other systems might offer. Secondly, a few things that we have done in my state because there was not the resolve to go to an appointive system uh, despite several decades of effort by the Bar Association and uh, by other citizen groups. We now, by statute, provide that voter guides are mailed to every registered voter in the state. We also post the voter guides online. It is really enjoyable to go to the polling place and to see so many people actually carrying that voter guide with them. Because I must admit, even though I was supportive of doing this, I really wondered is this just another piece of mail with all the mail we get that people would discard or not have with them? And I have been very pleased to see about one out of four, one out of five voters, and this is not empirical data, but just observation over time, actually carrying that voter guide with them. So I think we do have a situation where voters are looking for additional information about their judges. And we do have polling data that tends to suggest that about two-thirds of voters actually believe the very qualities that we as lawyers would like to see paramount of our judges, fairness, impartiality, independence, these are the values of about two-thirds of the voters that would be voting in these elections. So I think if we can do voter, better public education about the distinctive role of judges in our tripartite system of government, we have appropriate roles for the legislative branch, appropriate roles for the executive branch, and yes, appropriate and distinctive roles for our judicial branch. If we can do a better job of educating citizens about these values and why they are necessary for the long-term survival of the rule of law, uh, I think we can do a lot better in minimizing some of the issues that we've been seeing in recent decades. Thank you, Justice Martin. Uh, next is, is a former Chief Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, and it's Justice Richard Neely. I wondered, Justice Neely, whether you could give us your views on campaign financing, how it would work, what is possible, what isn't, and I think you may have had some experience with the Caperton matter. I did. I, once upon a time as a child, as a young lawyer, actually, I drove into the little town of Bealington, West Virginia, and there was a constable standing on the street corner. And I said to him, Officer, what rec restaurant do you recommend here for lunch? And he said, well, there are two restaurants. 
Hallers and Smiths, you go to either one of them, they're both about the same. And I said, well, I said, if you were going to go to one and have lunch today, which one would you go to? He said, son, he said, they're both the same, but whichever one you go to, you'll wish to hell you'd gone to the other one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's, that, that's pretty much uh, the issue of judicial selection. Uh, if you, I mean, there, there's hardly anybody here there's not a swinging Richard in this room who wouldn't vote to recall John Roberts. Everybody who wouldn't vote to recall John Roberts if there were a recall election, raise your hand. See? <laughs> Sam Alito wouldn't do much better. Uh, you know, so, I mean, and down the street at the Federalist Society, uh, the meeting uh, up at the Four Seasons, um, <laughs> They, uh, they, 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 they've held the same straw poll, and not a single person would not not recall Sotomayor or, or Ginsburg. So the, the, the problem is that, that judges do make law all the time. Now, don't confuse what I'm saying today with, with a personal opinion. Um, I think that it is extraordinarily important for judges to listen to the people with whom they disagree. If I were in West Virginia and the legislature passed a statute authorizing single-sex marriage, I could write a perfectly competent, extremely well-reasoned opinion holding that statute unconstitutional on the basis of substantive due process. I mean, I could talk about history. I could talk about the original intent of the West Virginia Constitution, going back to the Virginia Constitution, going back to the religious roots of law. I mean, I could do a whole shtick um, that, would, uh, that would, uh, would strike that statute down. The notion somehow that there is some platonic ideal of law that we're all looking for um, is just not right. It's not correct. All of these things require uh, judgment, but they also require values. And the problem that I have is that frequently judges aren't listening to the values and the arguments of the people with whom they disagree. I think that one way of avoiding some of these problems is to engage in a certain level of judicial restraint. I had to agree with Judge Wilkinson this morning that courts have always made law. It, it, in fact, it, at the, in the reign of Henry I, courts made all the law, and they virtually made all the law up until the reign of William III. In other words, from, from the, the middle of the 12th century until the, the end of the 17th century. Courts inherently make law, not just in constitutional law, that's the, that's the tip of the iceberg. Mostly they're interpreting statutes, they're modifying the common law, et cetera. But one has to be careful about using statutes or the Constitution as a springboard for personal opinions. Um, Brown versus Board of Education was real law. Plessy versus Ferguson was a perversion. Everybody looks to Brown as a vindication of, of, uh, of civil rights, but Brown, the, 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 the amendments really said what Brown said. There wasn't any interpretation there. Plessy was the interpretation. It, it, often courts make law because there are structural impediments. I think of Baker versus Carr. Nobody disagreed with Baker versus Carr except four farmers in Georgia who happened to the four of them hold one seat in the state senate. Uh, you know, it, Baker versus Carr was necessary because there were structural impediments, uh, impediments. If you look at the whole history of administrative law, what you find is that, that people trust judges who are, ap after all, like me. They're old, tired, political whores who've really been around the, 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 been around the, 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 the horn, and, and the bureaucrats and the administrators are you know, young kids who just graduated magna cum laude from Harvard or Yale or someplace. 
So the, the, you know, I mean, most administrative agencies are like the Army, the system designed by geniuses to be executed by idiots. Um, so you, you, have, you have judicial supervision of certain administrative agency thing because of the, of the bureaucratic impediments, and imperatives rather, that you have in these, in these things. It, so what do you do about, about judges and the, and, the, and the independence of the judiciary? One thing you do is that you avoid cases where the other institutions of government are actively pursuing things. Again, I point to Roe versus Wade. You realize, and, and this is Marianne Glendon from Harvard who wrote a whole book about this. In Europe, Roe versus Wade is the law and it was all done legislatively. Except for Ireland where abortion is prohibited and Sweden where you can you know, do it in the back seat of a car you know, with your kid sister. Every other state, every other country, every other country has essentially the same rules on abortion and they parallel very much what we've had in Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade had, uh, went a long way towards destroying the civility in, in, the, in, in much of the American judiciary uh, because it was a bridge too far. Uh, so that one thing that courts have to do is, is listen to people they disagree with take those opinions into consideration and not try and intrude into areas where legislatures and executives are extremely active and where the political process is working. And the second thing in the, in the, in the um, elected judiciaries, and it, when I last looked, 22 states had partisan full elections of the judiciary. The second thing is to try and reverse Republican Party of Minnesota versus white. Um, it, when I ran for office, we had no contention in a partisan judicial race. No one ever made a comment about any decision, about any, any, any rule of law. Uh, no one said we're going to put all the criminals in jail. No one talked about anything because the canons of judicial ethics prohibited any person running for judicial office from making a statement with regard to any issue that would come before the court. And we all followed it, and there was no contention. Republican Party versus white is what ruined the state elective system. Uh, the state elective system, when, when conducted by gentlemen uh, or gentle ladies, uh, works pretty well. And only judges who have been somewhat outrageous get recalled. Uh, or, or get defeated in, in, in office. But the, the opening it up, the Republican Party versus white, made judges just another political actor. And there's not much you can do about that. And you say, well, let's go to the appointed system. Well, the appointed system is such that, that now the dialogue is so contentious and it's so polarized that you're liable to get the Sam Alitos of the world uh, dominating your court system and they're going to be there forever, you know? So it, it's not any improvement to say we're going to go to some kind of an appointed system. Um, I suppose that, that my, my ideal is to repeal uh, uh, Republican Party versus white, uh, to restore uh, the canons of judicial ethics to uh, elected races, and to continue to live with elected judges as we did at judges in Alabama. Um, and the appointed, you know, the, the Missouri plan works well enough too. But there again, uh, part of it is the, the failure of the courts to take into consideration that they are sometimes making cases that are highly debatable and are not really law. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justice Harold C., former Associate Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. I, you know, I, I surprisingly, to me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in, in general agreement with uh, each of the of the three speakers. I, I, I guess I, I would uh, phrase it uh, this way: uh, a couple of things have happened in the judiciary. Uh, one uh, is that. Uh, uh, that the judiciary has become much more democratic, uh, a small d democratic, uh, that people who never would have had the opportunity to go to law school, let alone become lawyers or judges, are now lawyers and judges. 
I think that's a good thing. Uh, but of course, they no longer just associate with one another at the country club. Uh, at the time when they all associated with one another at the country club, all came from the same class of society, all got the same education. Uh, they could uh, discipline one another through, uh, you know, through uh, ignoring one, ignoring someone who uh, behaved improperly, or uh, through uh, making comments, or not inviting them places, uh, and and so there was a, a, a certain you know control uh, over the judiciary that we now, to, in my mind, thankfully, no longer have. We have people from all sorts of backgrounds who have. Uh, grown up to become lawyers and to become uh, judges, but it means that the that you know the judiciary is more diverse. Uh, the second thing is uh, that what uh, Tocqueville uh, uh, predicted in uh, Democracy in America, uh, or predicted, observed, which is every dispute uh, uh, in in America ultimately becomes a legal dispute. Uh, <clears throat> I can't tell you the number of uh, high school football games uh, that were appealed to the Alabama Supreme Court. And we we uh, and sent them back to the trial court and instructed the trial court to dismiss them. Um, but you know, it, things, things have moved in the judiciary and, and the stakes have gotten very high. Uh, so that there are, you know, in, in terms of money, you know, there are, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of, of dollars uh, at stake depending upon rulings uh, by judges. Uh, and then on social issues, you know, the, whether you win or you lose a social, you know, that you may feel very strongly about, depends on the judges. Well, if that's where the decisions are being made, where is the energy and the money going to go? It's going to go into making sure that the right folks are there. I, uh, the comment was made on, on the earlier panel that uh, you know, everyone favors judicial activism. It's just his own judicial activism. Uh, and, and, and I certainly agree uh, that judicial restraint is a good way to minimize that. If everything's predictable, that is, you know, we know how the courts are going to decide. They've always decided that way, and, it, and it's, it's predictable. Now, everything won't be predictable, but if, if, if in general things are predictable, uh, I think you'll see a, a lot more, a lot less going into it. If, it, if it's not going to matter uh, to, to my pocketbook or to my emotional concerns, uh, whether candidate A or candidate B uh, is, uh, is, is the judge, uh, then I'm not going to be putting the energy and the money into it. But you know, I look at it, and 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 we can we can say, well, we're going to take the politics uh, out of all this. I mean, that's that was the intention of Missouri Plan. Does it look like the politics got taken out of it? No. And in fact, the politics was in there at the beginning too. You look at uh, that study was done not too long ago, of uh, of uh, the appointments in Missouri and Tennessee, uh, and overwhelmingly, judicial appointments in both of those states were of Democrats. Now, you can look at that and say, well, I'm a Democrat. I like it. That's good. You know? But remember, it's not neutral then. It, 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 is, wouldn't it strike you as incredible if all of these folks are Democrats and there's no politics in it? There is some political. And in another state, it might well be all Republicans. Uh, but if the, if the desire is to take the politics out, it doesn't do it. It puts the politics underground. I, I know I, I uh, thought one of the things, I, I ran in open elections, and I watched folks being confirmed uh, to the federal bench, and I thought, man, I wouldn't put myself through that. But look at what, look at what they're saying about these folks. Look at, look at how they're attacking them, and they can't respond. They don't dare respond. Look at uh, a, uh, a retention election. Just uh, as, as Justice Turner has mentioned, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're sitting there, uh, an open target, because you have no campaign committee, you have no money, you have no experience running for office, and then somebody well organized comes in, what, you're defenseless. I wouldn't want to be like that. I'd want to be able to defend myself. And so, you know, yeah, I, I, I ran in open elections, and that meant I had to raise money, it meant I had to go out and, uh, and, and get people uh, to support me, but I could respond. Now, my, can the, my campaign, as the campaign against me, 
1996, uh, I'm, I'm told the, was the Associated Press, uh, I believe it was Associated Press, voted the nastiest election uh, in the United States that year. Uh, I, yeah, I was attacked, you name it, and I, and I was attacked for it. I, I hear people who say, I wouldn't want to run because of what I did back when I was in college or something like that. It doesn't matter. They'll make it up. Right? That's right. No question uh, about that. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, the, 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 yeah, you know, nasty things get said. But I could answer. I had the means to get out there and respond. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you re remember, you've got the election. In, in the Missouri plan, but because there's no party affiliation, there's no, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's no opponent. First of all, you don't get much information because there's no one there to generate the information, but if you do, that person is a sitting duck. Now, I will say something about the California. Following the Rose Bird uh, removal, uh, there was an announcement made, uh, I say following, I think it might have been it's 10 years later, but you may remember this, uh, that there was a group that was going to go after three Republican justices on the California Supreme Court. They announced it in August. Big mistake. Because those justices then organized committees, got the word out, uh, you know, raised some money to respond, and it cost some money to get the word out. I mean, it's just, that's a lie. Uh, and, and, and they were retained. Uh, and, and in fact, given the nature of retention elections, it's, it's hard to, to remove somebody in a retention election. But that's assuming that they have the means and that they do get out there and respond. That really uh, leads me to, to a, another point, and, and that is I think we judges and lawyers do a lousy job of communicating what we're doing. In general, I, I, you know, I, I can't speak to Iowa except that I do know, you know if, to the extent that they were raising this, they're dictators. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, there, there, there has to have been, that, that has to have struck a chord with voters, right? I mean, if, it, 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 as I've observed it, incumbents don't get removed unless the public thinks there's a problem and identifies it with the incumbent. Of course, the way they identify it with the incumbent is somebody gets out there and spends a lot of money and effort, and they say, and this is the, and this is the, the, the person, and this is the reason. Uh, uh, and and it, it seems to me it's awful easy for judges to become the target because we, we have a practice of not talking to people. Now, you know, the, the canons urge us to go out and educate people, but we tend not to. Now, in an elective state, you do a lot more of that because you know you're going to be standing in front of the electorate. So, you know, I'd be going out, and my colleagues on the court would be going out. We'd be talking to groups every week uh, because you need to let them know what you're doing. I, mean, I had a decision used against me uh, that, uh, that, that I had made, I think, on the law. It was simple, clear cut. It was an emotional case involving a child uh, custody matter and a motivated uh, 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 person uh, and, and motivated and well-known. A uh, person uh, who, uh, who, who was affected by it uh, went out and campaigned uh, against me. I think, you know, given the message that was out there, you know, I might have removed me. Uh, but, um, but voters, you know, but, but I got out there, I talked about it. I don't know how many people I convinced, but at least I think convinced them that if I'd done it, I did it, you know, not out of ill will, not for any improper motive. And that, uh, and that I could be forgiven a mistake. And I think generally the public understands that, yeah, all of us make mistakes. And OK, maybe he made a mistake on this one. Uh, but I think he's doing a good job in general. But we don't get that unless they get to know us, unless they get to know what it is we're doing. Also, I think they understand. And we can, you know, this is one of those issues that we can debate. There are people who think that uh, the public is, is so ignorant of the judicial function uh, that we can't, they, they can't be voting on it. They, they, don't, they don't understand it, and therefore we can't let them vote. Um, yeah, that's not what I find. I find they do understand the judicial function. That they do understand that, uh, that our job is different, that we're supposed to interpret the law, that we're supposed to protect minority rights. 
And I think they expect us to do that. I mean, I, gosh, I, I, I overturned a couple, oh, not, not by myself, all right, I joined the majority uh, mm -hmm. and overturned a couple of death penalty cases. This is Alabama, right? I wasn't removed because, you know, generally, a, you know, a, 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 I was asked one time if, uh, if we had any liberal Democrats on our court, and I said, well, yes, but, and I was talking to somebody from the Massachusetts Supreme Court, I said, on the Massachusetts Supreme Court, you consider him a conservative Republican. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, where was I going with that? Uh, <laughs> anyway, my, 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 uh, my, general, my general point here is that we need to let the public know what the judicial function is. If they don't, I think they're intelligent enough, I think they understand that. Uh, but if they don't, it's our fault. Right? We, we need to get out there. That's the solution to the problem. I'll say one other thing on, on the, along those lines, and that is I think when we're, what we're talking about here is, a, is at bottom, fundamentally, a constitutional question. That is, what does the Constitution mean by the judicial function? I think the Constitution belongs to the people, right? I mean, I, I, you know, we can debate that, and, and granted it was representatives of the people who voted on the Constitution. I think fundamentally it's the people's document. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 so, and I think fundamentally it's going to be what the people allow it to be. That means all the more, it's all the more important that we get word out, that we talk to the public, that we describe the judicial function, that we talk about what it is. And, and as I say, I think it's important for us to exercise uh, judicial restraint. Um, I did want to, I did want to make this, this uh, comment. I talked about the, 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 uh, you know, the, the various methods of selection, and, and I, I just want to emphasize the problems are the same, right? The problems are the same regardless of the method of selection because those problems are the problems of, of what the ju ju judiciary is doing, the money problems, the emotional issue uh, problems. And therefore, they're going to be in every system. There's going to be politics in selection regardless. Uh, there's going to be politics involved in removal regardless. There's going to be money. Did you, I, I saw figures one time just on the television money that was spent uh, and, on the Alito uh, confirmation. And I don't remember the millions of dollars it was, but you know, a significant number of millions of dollars spent. And, and this is just the television money reporting. You know a lot more got spent on both sides. Right? You, so, so there is enormous amount of money because money's an issue in this appointment process or in any state appointment process. Uh, in, in, in a Missouri plan, you know, it, 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 those same problems are there. Our fundamental question is what's the, what's the best way to deal with them and, and, and then sort of how we can finish things off along, uh, along the edges. Thank you. Uh, before we reach our last speaker, I just want to add one or two things again. There are two different problems, I think, in state elections. Uh, one is the social issue, abortion, death penalty, gay marriage, uh, those issues which divide the people. And I know one answer is, well, courts shouldn't decide that, but courts do decide those issues. Uh, but that's one type of issue uh, that has caused problems with retention elections. Uh, the second type of issue is the Caperton issue. Uh, the issue where a large corporation or an insurance, the insurance carriers on one side, the trial lawyers on the other side, will spend millions to try to get the majority in certain Supreme Courts. And it's not a question of a judge answering that, uh, as much as it is of a public fight with millions of dollars over who's going to control the state Supreme Court. Uh, those are two different problems that I think we could discuss. And uh, what we do about it, is it inevitable that all those millions can be spent in state elections? I know one solution is repeal uh, Republican Party versus white. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court's view in that case is if you're going to have elections, uh, money's going to be spent, and you can't restrict speech in elections. Maybe that can change if the Supreme Court changes, but not likely in the immediate future. Uh, the other problem is 
the difference between federal judges and state judges. You may have a fight over confirmation, uh, but I can't remember the last time anyone was defeated, except Bork, who defeated himself. Uh, wasn't the money that defeated Bork. The other difference with federal uh, judges and state judges uh, is that you have that fight once at confirmation. After that happens, the judge can vote however he wants, do whatever he wants, without fear that somebody's going to remove him, the governor who appointed him, or the succeeding governor, as in New Jersey, uh, is not going to reappoint the judge who has a year or two left because he doesn't like his decisions, uh, or the votes of the people. Uh, it's the question of the effect. Now, I, I, we have a very honorable body, and I'm sure none of them were ever affected in any way in how they voted on in, during their job. Obviously, one of them wasn't, or she wouldn't be here today. Uh, but there, there are judges. I've talked to a Supreme Court judge in a state who said I could never vote on a death penalty case uh, to reverse. I wouldn't be here the next year. Uh, that was a Southern judge several years ago. Uh, and in California, one of our better Supreme Court ju justices, Otto Kaus, said, uh, he's now retired, said, you can never be unaware when you vote of the alligator in the bathtub, you know, that you're going to have to face an election. Uh, so there is a difference between money spent at appointment and, and the, at the time of appointment and the money spent later where you have to be concerned, you shouldn't be concerned, and most judges certainly aren't concerned. But it is a, a problem uh, that can only affect you at the time you're voting instead of at the time you're appointed. What views do you have on any of these issues? Uh, my, our final speaker is Justice uh, Myra Selby, uh, former Associate Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. Thanks, Judge Reinhardt. And um, <clears throat> I would, too, like to uh, say thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, very fine panel this morning. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit, uh, just like uh, you, you've posed a question, I'm going to do a little bit like my uh, fellow panelists have done and not necessarily answer the question <laughs> that you've, uh, you've asked. Um, I'd like to first say that um, um, I, I, I am not, um, I like to think of myself as uh, being I'm not old and I'm not tired and I'm not a political whore um, <laughs> because I come from a state judicial system that uh, both reflects the Missouri plan and elected uh, judges. So Indiana has both. Our appellate court judges, our court of appeals and Supreme Court judges um, are uh, selected via the Missouri plan that you heard Justice Turnus uh, um, describe. Our um, trial court judges, however, are elected in partisan elections. Um, having said that, there are two exceptions, two counties that have slight variations on that, and I will just call them um, misbehaving um, for purposes of discussion today. So we have both systems going on at the same time in the same state. Um, does that mean we don't have the problems that you've heard described earlier um, attendant to um, electing judges um, in partisan elections, or we don't have the problems attendant to uh, a retention um, unseating that, that Justice Turnus described? Certainly not. Um, I think all of the perils and the weaknesses of both systems um, we have seen in Indiana. What we have not seen is the more dramatic shifts that come from um, uh, pouring millions of dollars into campaigns either to unseat from retention or defeat in a partisan election um, judges on the ballot. And again, that may be because our, our citizens are, are sleepy. Um, I think, and, and, and certainly agree with what Justice C's perspective, that um, if, if judicial independence is in peril, um, and I, I believe that it is not necessarily 
um, but I believe that, that it's close, and Iowa is a wake-up call. Um, I think that if judicial independence is in peril, it's incumbent upon judges, lawyers, and members of our profession to do something about it. Not because uh, the you know, average citizen Joe doesn't understand what judges do. They do. Um, they understand it to the extent that it affects them in their daily lives. But that doesn't mean that they really understand how the rule of law operates in our system and how judicial independence is something that must be, in order to be preserved, must be protected. Um, in our state, uh, I chair our, our commission on uh, race and gender fairness in, in Indiana. And a couple of years ago, we went out across the state to all 92 counties and held public forums with citizens to talk about their perspective on the, uh, how the courts were working, what was their, what was their point of view. Uh, we were obviously focusing on questions of race and gender, but this uh, was a wide open forum. And one of the most startling results that we got were the comments across the board in all areas, all cities, all counties, whether rural or urban, uh, regardless of size, uh, comments from people reflecting how little they really do understand the system of government that they live in, 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 in our state. And that is to say, not that they don't understand what judges do, but they did not understand, for example, that the police in law enforcement are not part of or related to the prosecutor, and that the prosecutor is not part of or related to the judge. We got many comments from citizens reflecting that they thought that was all one seamless system. If that's what you think about how the criminal justice system operates, just imagine what you're gonna think about the results if and when you encounter that system. So one of, the, one of the tasks that we've been focusing on is civic education um, and, and helping citizens understand the system we live in. You know, the, the world has changed. We have many, many schools that don't include civic education as either a required or a commonly uh, available uh, subject. And so, you know, the, some school curriculums get added indirectly by classes like government and um, history and all, that, all of that sort of thing, but do they really teach in our students' understanding and being educated about how the system is intended to work and how it does in fact work? Elected versus appointed has also been discussed in the context not just of judicial independence, but access. Um, there have been many studies that have shown that uh, access to the judiciary and, and, and um, uh, elections um, have more of an, uh, of an effect of opening up access to the judiciary by candidates that haven't traditionally been uh, in the judiciary. So um, uh, states where we haven't seen high numbers of women and uh, lawyers of color getting access to the judiciary, the studies have shown that that's enhanced uh, through elected um, uh, judges rather than through the merit selection or the Missouri um, selection uh, plan. I was the beneficiary of um, uh, a merit selection uh, gubernatorial appointment in our state. Um, I was the first uh, woman, the first um, judge of color on our Supreme Court. Um, Indiana remains one of the only states in the country today since I stepped down, uh, remains one of the only states in the country that doesn't have a woman on the high court. So from my perspective, I think the value of independence also has to include the value of diversity on, on courts and in courts. So when we're looking at either, if it's either or, or what needs to happen to improve, um, I think diversity must be um, also a, a value that goes along with that. And 
I'm quite sure that uh, when, when Justice C, when you were talking about uh, judges sort of, uh, I think, governed themselves uh, in, in, in the past because it was a small group and it was a group of individuals that maybe shared common experiences. It is true that that's no longer the case. And, and I, I, that's a good thing um, in my view and I, and I think in the view of uh, certainly of the people on the panel today. But what that also means is that um, we, we need to be more mindful of, of how we can best lift up the judiciary um, given the fact that we do want and have a more diverse judiciary and we want to continue that. And so I think that means we have to consider all options on the table with respect to, um, to making sure the judiciary in this country is in the position of protecting, defending, and upholding the rule of law as we do, uh, for an example, uh, for other democracies and other um, um, countries around the world. But really it starts with not judges or lawyers, but the, you know, sort of the average Joe and his or her understanding um, of what judging and what the judiciary is all about. Um, Going back to, I, I will attempt, Judge Reinhardt, to, to sort of briefly touch on um, one of your questions, and that is, is it, you know, it, it is our only option to wait until the Supreme Court perhaps reverses or, or, um, or in some way we see a chipping away at the Republican Party uh, uh, decision? I, I think that that's, that's not, um, I don't think that's a desirable uh, course. Um, as much as um, many of us uh, are frustrated by that decision or don't like the decision um, or maybe even think the decision is wrong, it, it, that is the law uh, currently. And so I think that um, any solution has to take that into account because um, I don't think you can unring that bell. And so I think what really needs to happen is a you know, facing of that um, in going forward and doing the work of um, making sure that, that we as judges, lawyers in the system um, do what we can to make sure that it remains the system that we, uh, that we hold dear. Thank you. Thank you. One other question, I'll try again. Uh, <laughs> one other question is a number of uh, members of the panel have suggested as some members of the earlier panel did, more judicial restraint. Uh, we've also talked about the need to educate the public. Uh, do you think it's possible to educate the public to the idea that the job of judges is to protect the Bill of Rights, which was designed to protect the people in this country against majority views, uh, to protect the rights of minorities against the view of the minority, I mean the view of the majority. Uh, you think that's possible to educate the majority to give up its power and control over what to do when it affects minorities? Uh, we almost didn't do it in Brown versus Board of Education, which now everyone says is oh so wonderful, you didn't even need it, but it was really a five to four vote when it started. And I would hate to ask the question of how it would have come out had the present members of the Supreme Court been there. Uh, is that possible to get the majority of people to say, oh, wonderful, these are judges who reject our views? Well, I'll give it a shot. I think that, that civil rights and civil liberties are something that percolate up from the, from the, from the, the very coal camps and farms um, uh, and stores of America and does not percolate down from a, a, an Ivy League trained elite sitting on, uh, on the Supreme Court of the United States or any other court. I believe in what President Roosevelt said was the common sense of the common man. What made civil rights and civil liberties in this country was not Brown versus Board of Education. It was a sense of decency among uh, just 
common, ordinary people. Uh, and, in, in, and that's reflected in the Civil Rights Acts. I mean, it's reflected in certain legal structures. But what it's mostly reflected in is people being nicer to one another. I mean, I'm old. Uh, I mean, I, I thought I was put on this panel to be with the memory of man that runneth not to the contrary, but obviously Judge Reinhardt uh, has, has taken that, uh, that role away. Uh, but but I, I, I can remember America in the 1940s, you know, and the early 1950s. People were not particularly nice to one another. You know, there was a lot more bullying in schools, uh, a lot more people being ungracious to one another, but using uh, uh, vituperative epithets, you know, the N word, the this word, the, you know, a whole bunch of other, you know, wops, kikes, I mean, you could, a whole panoply of things. People don't do that anymore. People say, have a nice day. Now, <laughs> there, are, there are people who, there are people who think these words. There are people who probably, you know, aren't all that enthusiastic about elements of diversity, but they check themselves. They really work at being decent to one another. I don't think that we have to explain anything to the, to the ordinary guy. I think the ordinary guy does have some strong feelings about a, a number of social issues, and I think those feelings have to be respected. Um, and I think there has to be a dialogue. What kills me is that people don't talk to one another the way they, when I was in the legislature in 1971, we all went to dinner together. We didn't have polarization. There weren't 10 partisan votes in the entire legislative session. And when there were, there was a big sign that went up, partisan vote, so everybody split, voted, and went home, usually went out and drank. That's what we did. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's money. I'll give you one, just one last example, and I'll shut up. I one time got hired by Jones Day and the Lowen Group, a big, a big um, funeral home company in Canada, to be an expert witness in the first case ever brought against the government of the United States under, I think it's, it's Section 12 of the NAFTA uh, Free Trade Agreement, for a complete denial of justice in the courts of Mississippi. Uh, Lowen Group got, uh, had a judgment of about uh, $400 million entered against it. And the Mississippi Supreme Court would not allow an appeal unless they post a cash bond of $500 million. And they uh, agreed to do all kinds of things to preserve the integrity of the judgment, but they couldn't come up with a $500 million bond, and they had to settle for, I think, something like $200 million bankrupt of the co company. I went down to Mississippi, and here's what I saw. After four days, I realized that in the partisan races in Mississippi, nobody cared about criminal law. Criminals were, a, the, you had the trial lawyers on one side and you had the, the big corporations, you know, the petrochemical industry on the Gulf, um, insurance companies on the other side. They put lots of money into judicial races and these judges talked about, well, I think that we ought to put all the criminals in jail. And the other judge said, well, I put all the criminals in jail, but then I'd put some innocent people in jail just to make sure we don't miss anybody. Okay. Then the other guy came back, and it was, a, it was also a racially, you know, there were code words and things in this campaign. Well, this was money fighting money. It's pretty hard, it's pretty hard to avoid that. There, there, isn't, there isn't really any way to do it, but with regard to the common sense of the common man, most of the time he can see through that stuff. Just one last example of being a political whore. One time I was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and in came Tom Flaherty, who was the newly elected president of the State Bar Association. He made his courtesy call on the Chief Justice. He said, Judge, he said, we have a resolution at the State Bar to have the nonpartisan election of judges. He said, well, what do you think? And I said, I said, I think I can kill it on the floor of the House of Delegates because I've still got the privilege of the floor. And he said, oh, and he looked crestfallen. And the reason that I wouldn't allow it to go through was I'm not having any Republican judges. Right? Under our system, Democrats get elected judges, and why would I allow for nonpartisan election of judges when it means Republicans? Because I actually believe that there's a difference between the two parties. I mean, I think that there are good people in both parties, lots of people trying to make the world a better place, but by and large, Republicans tend to take care of the people who don't need taken care of, and the Democrats tend to take care of the people who do. So. That's, that was my decision, and you aren't ever going to beat that kind of a decision. 
no matter where you are, no matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, a communist or a fascist, no matter how impartial you say you are, no matter how much you, uh, you, you swear that you're not just a political hack, you know, and a, and a well-used whore, by God, when it comes down to it, that's how you're going to decide. Well, could, 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 I, could I add to that, that in Alabama, when the legislature was controlled by the Democratic Party, they would not allow for nonpartisan elections. When the Republicans took over, they won't allow That's for right. nonpartisan elections. <laughs> Let me uh, try to respond to the moderator's questions about some of the challenges we, we have in the elective systems. As you can tell, even among the panel and out across America, there's a lot of support for judicial elections. So how do we deal with the increasing issue-based campaigns that we see in state judicial elections in light of Minnesota v. White? The danger, of course, is how do you expect justices that are elected uh, who go out and run issue-based campaigns to be elected by a majority to be in a position to stand up for the rights of the minority? And so there's tension there. So one, uh, some of the approaches that the ABA has promulgated and suggested to the jurisdictions, one would relate to issue-based campaigns, the announce clause, and also you have uh, a new uh, provision that appeared in, in 1999 for the first time and is found Rule 2.11A4 of the 2007 Model Code which under certain circumstances would require judges to recuse uh, for campaign contributions that were made by a party, the party's attorney, or the law firm uh, of that lawyer. And the provision is then submitted to the states for two questions to be answered. One is a threshold question about how much money should that be. Uh, a second uh, determination by the state would have to be for what period of time preceding the election. And just to illustrate how that would work, uh, only a handful of states have followed this recommendation at this point. One is Arizona, where the state Supreme Court has set the threshold uh, as the legal limit required by state election statutes within a period of four years preceding the election. And the Utah Supreme Court in Utah, judges are appointed, and they stand only for uh, retention elections. The Utah Supreme Court has established the monetary threshold at $50 for a period three years preceding the election. So there are some practical ways that we can try to ameliorate some of the issue-based uh, campaigns that are being run. We can use recusal rules to make sure that if a judicial candidate has totally staked himself out on a contentious issue, and, and goes across the line established by the ethics code that uh, the judge on his own motion or upon motion of any party to the proceeding could challenge his ability to be fair and impartial and to consider that proceeding. And the same thing with uh, campaign finance. Uh, panelists have talked this morning about how elections require money. That is true. But I think particularly with judges, when you diffuse that over a greater number of people, perhaps some from the trial lawyer side, perhaps some from uh, the manufacturing side and other areas of the state where actually judges are given more modest amounts of money because people think they've done a good job. And remember the comments made this morning about how you know the common folk have this innate sense of civil rights. I don't know if that's always true, but to be sure, if you allow more modest amounts from a broader base in society uh, to provide that funding, it would seem to me you would have less potential for uh, the appearance of partiality in how judges operate. All right, we've come to the question and answer period. I saw Judge McKee, the chief judge of the Third Circuit in the audience. He said maybe can give us some good advice because he's the only one here, I think, who has been both a state judge and a federal judge. I'm, judge I, McKee, how did you like the program? I think it was a fantastic program. I came in That's bit, the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you paid me to say, right? Now, uh, you, you pick up the cocktail tonight. I came in somewhat concerned about independence, and I'm leaving even more concerned, I think, about it. Um, 
if I can, before I respond to your question, let me get into the diversity issue because I think that is crucial. I think uh, what Justice um, Neely said about judicial restraint is very, very important uh, at all levels of the judiciary, but I think we oftentimes ignore the fact that that's one of the big strengths of diversity, that the more diverse uh, input you will have going into a decision, particularly at the appellate level, you institutionalize judicial restraint because I can't decide anything unless I can get a second vote for my panel. And beyond that, unless I can carry a majority of my court, which is 14 judges, so I need at least seven judges to agree with my analysis or I can't, I'm going to get embarked in a, on a panel decision. And, and that within it has the kernel of judicial restraint. I many times cannot go as far as I would like to, nor can one of my uh, colleagues who might see things differently because they're not going to be able to get the votes they need to carry beyond the panel or to escape an unbanked vote. On the substantive issue here, it seems to me that any system which uh, is created for judicial selection or retention, which has within it a component which requires or suggests to a judge, as he or she is deciding a case, that they have to look over their shoulder to the consequences of that decision, as it is, is a system which puts judicial independence at peril. That judges cannot function as judges in a system if we have to look over our shoulder to the political consequences of, a, of an opinion, be it a dissenting opinion, a concurring opinion, or a majority opinion. And that can be because of retention election in the state system or even in the federal system. And I, and I just as, didn't mean to get into this, but as an aside, because it goes to the federal system, um, not that long ago, after I became chief, I was trying to put together a, a sitting schedule, and I was having lunch with a district court colleague, and I was asking her if she wanted to sit with us by designation because I had about eight slots I needed to fill. And she said, well, I'll do that if you promise me you won't use me for any controversial case. And I said, what are you talking about? And she recounted an instance where several years ago, she was sitting with some colleagues in another court, uh, another district, and in that uh, um, court system, one of the cases before her was a case that was very, very inflammatory, had received a lot of national attention, and that case was one of the cases being argued to that appeals court panel. And in conference, her two colleagues suggested to her that she take the opinion because she wouldn't be around to suffer the consequences from the community of the colleagues, uh, given the unanimous vote to, to uphold the governmental action that was so at odds with community standards in that vote. That's in a federal system of guaranteed life tenure. She had been intimidated, and I left this really scratching my head. So I'm not, I guess, as enamored in the ability of the common person to understand what we deal with as many of my colleagues are. Another example, which has nothing to do with contentious legal issues, recently on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, we had a retention election following on the heels of a pay raise at the state level, which I have to say, because we all know that doesn't happen at the federal <laughs> level. Um, the, the Pennsylvania legislature voted in a pay raise for itself and the courts along with that. They rolled back in the face of public pressure the pay raise for the court system, I mean for the, for the legislature and for the court system. A challenge was brought and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled under the Pennsylvania uh, Constitution as the federal Constitution, you can't uh, diminish compensation for a judge. After, it's, after you get the compensation, you can't reduce the compensation for obvious reasons. After that, I think it was a year and a half after that, there was a retention election. Two of the judges who were on the court at the time were up for uh, retention. Both of them were one loss, first time in the history of the Commonwealth a judge had lost. The second one came within a whisper of losing, and the analysis that I read from two different sources suggested she only won because it was a female, and many people voted for her because of the, the gender politics, which I don't mean to disparage, I simply say that but for that, many people say she would have lost too. Now that was an issue that was perfectly clear under Pennsylvania law. You can't reduce compensation for judges after they've received the compensation. Shouldn't have been that controversial. Didn't involve abortion. Didn't involve the death penalty. There wasn't even a targeted movement against the judges. There was a targeted movement against the legislators who had voted that pay raise. And the fallout spilled over to the Supreme Court. So I guess I'm just not as comfortable with the intellect of my colleagues, uh, not colleagues, but, uh, well, colleagues, yeah, my, my, my colleagues, American citizens who comprise the electorate. And as one of my law clerks who, probably my, fam my, my favorite law clerk, refers to me as being arrogant because of that. So call me arrogant. But looking at American history as I have and even current history, I just don't, if you will, trust the majority to not take advantage of the minority 
get, if given the opportunity, and I think that's why courts are there, and if we don't mind our manners and make sure that the court system is vigilant of the rights of the minorities, I think those rights will be uh, eroded. One last thing, and I'll shut up and sit down. To the extent the federal level is seen as being better at the life tenure end, it is. The problem at the federal level, it seems to me, is the policy of blue slipping and senatorial privilege, which allows a senator, for whatever reason, be it um, good or bad, and they're almost always bad, to stop in the tracks a senatorial, uh, a presidential nominee. And the, the easy, easiest example of that is Goodwin Liu. No one doubts his qualifications, his mind, his analysis. No one doubts that at all. Some people don't like his politics. And I assume that the senators who voted against him were sufficiently educated in civics that they understood the role of the judges and they, mm -hmm. they didn't need for us to go out and tell them the importance of what we do, but they still voted against him for whatever reasons. And as a result, he, uh, we as a nation and the court system in particular lost a really fine judge. So I'm just not that optimistic. I'm a little more concerned, I think, as I said, than I was when I came in. But I'm not sure if that helps at all or not. <laughs>
you know, that, that supports that. I, I, there were some studies that were done. Um, so uh, so uh, I, think, I think that's, in fact, the way it works. You, you can't expect them to know all of the candidates. All, and, and in fact, they're not going to do all the research unless they get tipped off that they need to. Uh, what I'm more concerned about is just sort of the general notion of the judicial function. I'll tell you one thing as a lawyer you cannot do in order to help the public understand the judicial function, and that is when you lose a case, don't go to your client and say, well, you were right, but the judge was wrong. The judge was on the take. Or the, ju you know, the judge and that other lawyer just must be good friends. Uh, because that's sending a message as to how the function works. And frankly, you know, I don't see that. And I, you know, a comment was made about the good character of this panel, uh, and that we therefore probably weren't influenced. You know, uh, in, in fact, I suspect none of us were. And frankly, none of the justices I served with, and I served with a lot of judges. I, I started as most junior and, and retired as most senior justice on the Alabama Supreme Court. I served with a lot of them. I don't believe any of them were influenced, Democrats, Republicans. I don't think they were influenced by that much. Now, well, there's a problem of perception, and, and, uh, but, you know, I mean, why am I going to be influenced by con campaign contributions when I don't get to use that money? If I'm going to be influenced by money, I'm going to take a bribe, right? <laughs> That's your money. How many, how many judges are removed for bribery? It's rare. We give up private practice where we could make good money, right, to take state pay. Now, why are we going to sell that? And how, why would we sell it cheaply when we paid so much in order to get it? What we have, and all we have, is our integrity. Now, there's a lot of talk about judges being influenced and, uh, and gosh, we need to remove all these influences. It's not going to happen. H how many federal district court judges, you know, say below the age of 60, don't believe they ought to be on the U.S. Supreme Court? But how they decide cases may determine whether they get there or not. They can be influenced by that. Right? How about, uh, and we're talking about the judges who are most removed from influence, how about the federal judge who's, who has to read in the newspaper what those newspaper columnists are saying about his decisions? And, and, and his family has to read about that, and his friends have to read about that. Well, you know, maybe I don't want to decide it that way. Well, those influences are there, and they are going to be there. I had a, 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 a state Supreme Court justice tell me one time that a, a trial court judge has said, look, I, I decided this case, and I know it's wrong, I know it's contrary to the law, but I'm up for election, and so I had to decide it this way, and I'm leaving it to you to overturn it. Right? And, and, and the problem was, it was argued to be elections. Elections are the evil thing here. No, it's not. It's lack of character. If that judge is willing to decide contrary to the law to get elected, he'd be willing to decide contrary to the law for something else, too. Right? It's only a question of what temptation he's going to give in to. Fundamentally, we have to have people of integrity. Now, I think. Fortunately, we Supreme Court justices, state Supreme Court justices, don't get all that much pay, and that helps, right? Because we're in it for, for you know, to give back, basically, uh, for what's been given to us. Uh, but I, you know, I, I notice uh, a fair number of, of state trial court judges who have to leave the bench in order to make enough money to send their kids to college. So I think they're in the same position, generally. I, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in the integrity of judges, but I think we have to expect that. We have to demand it, we have to reward it by telling judges, I really appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, and, and then we need to tell people about it. We need to tell people, look, these are good, honest judges. I argued your case, I believed in your case, I did the best I could, but, you know, but we lost. And we lost because, not because, I mean, when he says, well, well the judge, I heard he's a good friend of so-and-so, I say, no, this is a good judge. This is an honest judge. He decided the case to the best of his ability. If you want to appeal it, we'll appeal it, and, uh, and, and, and we'll see what the Court of Appeals says, and I'll take your check now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm afraid the uh, time for questions has run out. I would just like to make one comment. I agree with you about federal judges. It's far from a perfect system or we wouldn't have the present Supreme Court we have. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it is, federal judges have the kind of pressures Judge 
McKee talked about. Um, but I've got to tell you, there's an awful lot of people with an awful lot of money uh, who think that when they contribute to election campaigns uh, and the millions that are spent by the trial lawyers on one side and the uh, insurance companies on the other, it's not that they think a judge is going to be bought. They think that they can elect a judge who has certain sympathies, certain values. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't take the money, but they know he sympathizes with the corporations, where some of them are even sympathize with the people. Uh, so it's not, none of them are dishonest, but we all have our own values. And they might rather have people whose values are different from yours. So, but I think everyone agrees there's a problem with the way we select all judges, federal and state, and let's hope we can improve both systems. And I'm afraid we have to go to lunch, but before we do, I have to tell you there's a lunch with Harold Cobb, dean of a fine law school. Yes. Uh, not one, one of those two schools <laughs> constantly being uh, school I graduated from. Reviled. Uh, yes, what a reviled as it were. <laughs> anyway, Harold Coe, who's a great friend of the organization, he's a State Department uh, legal advisor, who I hope wasn't responsible for that advice about Libya. Um, <laughs> and he's, lunch starts at 1 o'clock, which gives us 25 minutes to recover from this panel. Uh, <laughs> And then at 5 o'clock, Congressman Donna Edwards will be speaking in the presidential ballroom, as will the lunch for uh, Harold Coe. And the day will conclude with a reception in the Congressional and Senate rooms at 6 o'clock, and nobody speaking. All right, so that's it for this panel. Thank you all very much.